Okay, everybody, so welcome to the next lecture in A&P 1105A. Uh, so today we're doing part three of respiration, and the upload date is going to be December 4th, 2020. Um, so just a reminder, I posted about it in the announcement section, but I'm going to hold another review session ahead of the final exam. This one's going to be on December 13th at 10 a.m., and the link for that will be put onto Zoom. And so like last time, uh, you know, what you want covered, that's up to you. So, so send me any suggestions that you might have. Um, so we'll just start with a little bit of review from last time. And so last time we were talking about airflow, ventilation, air moving in and out of the lungs. And so the two big players here were the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. So these are the muscles here in the ribs. So most importantly, these external intercostal muscles. And the idea is that when the diaphragm contracts and when these external intercostal muscles contract, the rib cage is going to, to expand, the chest cavity is going to expand. So if the lungs are going to expand, that's going to cause an increase in volume. What happens when we have an increase in volume? We have a decrease in pressure. So uh, when we have a decrease of pressure, air is going to move into the lungs. And that's how it all works. Okay, uh, We talked about uh, three different features that impact the flow of air. Uh, going into the lungs. We talked about airway resistance. We talked about alveolar surface tension and lung compliance. Uh, we also talked about how we can measure ventilation. And so we talked about all these different volumes here. And so, for example, the tidal volume is about 500 mils, and this is the amount that goes in and out of your lungs under normal circumstances. Uh, but if we force the situation either by breathing out really hard or breathing in, with a lot of drama, then we can increase the amount of air that is going either in or out. Okay. Um, we also talked about external respiration. So external respiration specifically refers to the flow of gases uh, from the lungs into the bloodstream. Okay. And we talked about how this is impacted by partial pressure gradients and gas solubilities, the thickness and surface area of the membrane, so those alveoli. Um, and also something called ventilation perfusion coupling. And we'll just look at each of those again very, very quickly. So partial pressures. The idea here is that the pressure is going to differ between the blood, which is arriving at the alveoli, and uh, the alve alveoli themselves. And so as an example, for oxygen, the alveolar uh, partial pressure of oxygen is 104 millimeters mercury. Venous blood is 40 millimeters mercury. And so which way is this going to go? That's right, it's going to go into the venous blood. Okay, and so that's how we get oxygen exchange. Carbon dioxide goes the other direction. So it goes from the venous blood to the alveolar uh, area. And so that's coming out of your system. Now the partial pressure gradient is smaller here. We're talking about 104 versus 40, 45 and 40. These are a lot closer but we still get very good movement of carbon dioxide. And this is because compared to oxygen, carbon dioxide is actually very, very soluble in, in both uh, uh, blood plasma and in alveolar fluid. Okay, so remember that the al alveoli, I'm gonna keep struggling to say that word, I think, uh, they are covered in a very thin uh, sheet of fluid. If you remember, it's something called surfactant that is important for breaking the surface tension of that fluid. The other thing that can impact external respiration. Again, external respiration very specifically referring to the movement of gases uh, from the alveoli to the blood. Um, and so it's a thickness and, and surface area of the respiratory membrane. So thickness, um, usually this membrane is very, very thin. It can become waterlogged. In this case, uh, that thickness is going to increase. And so this is what happens in pneumonia. For something like emphysema, you can still expand your lungs really well, actually, but the problem is that the effective surface area is decreased. And so technically, uh, the lung tissue is there, but you can see that it's all degraded. Ventilation perfusion coupling, what does this mean? This basically means that if you want to have exchange between the alveolus and the oxygen that's in there and the bloodstream, you want the blood and the air meeting each other at the same time. So if you have blood flowing through this capillary and there's no oxygen in here, well, then you're not going to get any oxygen exchange. 
so usually this is something that's very highly regulated. Um, it can be regulated in different alveoli in different sections of the lung. Uh, we know that this perfusion coupling allows oxygen transfer very, very quickly, such that in just a very small fraction of a second, you get uh, an increase in the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, okay? So within less than half a second, you get 104 millimeters mercury, and that's the, the concentration that drives downstream events as well, and, and we'll talk about that today. So what, what are we doing today? So uh, today we're going to talk about internal respiration. So that's the movement from the blood and also uh, so the blood into the, the tissues specifically. Um, and then we're going to talk about transport. So transport actually uh, comes before internal respiration. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some biochemistry today and uh, some of the scientists that have done some work in this area. So uh, the, the section of chapter 22, in this case, to be reading is there. And in particular, pay attention to figure 22.1. As usual, there's an indication of a web resource there. Okay, so uh, remember when we were talking about external respiration, we were talking about um, partial pressures being really important. So I just talked about this. The fact that you have 104 versus 40 in the venous blood, uh, this is what is driving uh, movement from the alveoli into the blood system within the lungs. Again, reverse for carbon dioxide. Uh, when we have internal respiration, so again, this is going to be movement from the blood plasma into the tissues, uh, things are basically just the reverse. And so as an example, the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues is 40. And in the blood that's coming to those tissues, it's about 100. Okay. And so where does that come from? It comes from here. So when it arrives down to the tissues, it's at, a, at about 100 millimeters mercury. And so oxygen will move very quickly from the blood into the tissues. Again, internal respiration is going to be driven mostly by those partial pressure gradients um, and also the ability of the gases to diffuse. Again, we talked about oxygen being less able to diffuse than carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is going to be the opposite. So in the tissues, it's going to be at 45 millimeters mercury. Um, and then in the bloodstream, it's going to be at 40 millimeters mercury. So you have oxygen, which is going to move uh, into the, uh, into the, uh, um, or sorry, you have uh, the carbon dioxide is going to have a value of, yeah, 45 in the tissues versus uh, 40 in, in the blood. So yes, the, the carbon dioxide is going to be moving from the tissues into the blood. So again, it's just the reverse of what we talked about in terms of external respiration. Okay, so again, just to review, when we have external respiration, this is movement of gases from the lungs into the blood. And internal respiration refers to the movement of gases from the blood into the tissues. Okay. And so in each case, you have oxygen and you have carbon dioxide, which are traveling in opposite directions. That is driven by two factors. One of those is the partial pressure gradient. And the second of those is the diffusibility of those gases within liquid. Oxygen does not di uh, diffuse um, as well into, um, into liquid as does carbon dioxide. Okay. So uh, how does oxygen travel in the blood? We know that the lungs will deliver oxygen to the blood. It goes to the heart. But what is going on at the molecular level? And so there's actually two ways that oxygen can be carried in the blood. Uh, as we've been talking about, oxygen can dissolve in blood, okay? But it doesn't dissolve very well. So I've just said that a number of times. So about 1.5% of the total oxygen in your system, that's going to be directly dissolved in the plasma, okay? So that means it's dissolved within the liquid part of the blood. The vast majority, uh, 80, or sorry, 98.5%, is bound to iron atoms in hemoglobin of red blood cells, okay? So within your red blood cells, they are packed with a protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin actually consists of four polypeptides. So this red one, blue, purple, and green, these are all basically the same. And so these are just small proteins or what we call polypeptides 
they come together to form this larger molecule. Each of these, what we call subunits, can bind a heme molecule. This is what heme looks like. Heme has a lot of these nitrogen atoms, and they can bind, or what we call coordinate, an iron atom. And it's this iron atom which actually interacts with the O2 molecule. Okay, so again, we'll back up. Small amount of oxygen carried directly in the blood plasma. 98.5% of it is attached to hemoglobin. That hemoglobin is in red blood cells, and in particular, it's the iron atom of the hemoglobin which binds to these O2 molecules. Okay, um, so this is, is going to be the major way that oxygen is carried within your system. Okay, so it's not binding just to the random protein part, it's binding to a heme molecule, and in particular, the iron atom of that heme molecule. So uh, when uh, oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, we call it oxyhemoglobin. So that's reflected by this equation here. We have what we call reduced hemoglobin. When it binds to oxygen, it forms what's called um, oxyhemoglobin. And this will also produce a hydrogen ion. And as we'll see later, this is actually something which can impact blood pH. So in the lungs, this is what's happening. You're going in, in this direction. And in the tissues, you're going in this direction because you're picking up oxygen in the lungs. Hemoglobin is carrying it. But by the time we get down to the tissues, we want that oxygen to be released. And so the equation is forced to go in this direction. Now, hemoglobin, as I said, it's composed of four polypeptide chains. Again, each hemoglobin can transport four different O2 molecules. And so it doesn't have to carry all four. It can carry anywhere from zero to four. And so if it's fully saturated, so at 100%, we call this, uh, uh, this is when the uh, hemoglobin is carrying all four molecules, so it's going to carry four O2 groups. Partial saturation of hemoglobin refers to when you have either one, two, or three of these heme molecules which are carrying oxygen. So again, oxygen can exist in a variety of, uh, so oxyhemoglobin can exist in a variety of different states. It can be either fully saturated so that means it's carrying the most oxygen possible. Partially saturated means it's carrying either one, two, or three molecules of oxygen. We see molecules instead of atoms because we know that each molecule of oxygen, O2, is made up of two atoms. Okay, so don't get confused about that. Okay, so one of the interesting things in terms of biochemistry is that this binding of oxygen to hemoglobin is called, is called cooperative. And so what this means is that as you have one molecule of oxygen binding, the shape of the other uh, heme molecules and the associated, uh, sorry, the, 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 uh, of the other subunits and the associated heme, those will change structure or conformation, which makes it easier for the next oxygen to bind. As that next oxygen binds, it's even easier for the third one to bind, and all the way to four. So you can think of this event as being very slow, and each of these subsequent events is faster. So this guy here, it's very hard for oxygen to interact with this. But once oxygen does able to bind, then the structure of some of the adjacent subunits of the globin molecules uh, it makes it easier for the next atom to bind. And likewise, that will convert the final subunit to make it easier for oxygen to bind as well. The end result is that you have what's called cooperativity. Again, this event is going to be slow. As you move up, these events are going to be fast. Okay, so if you have three oxygen atoms bound, then uh, it's going to be very easy to bind that fourth atom of oxygen. 
So why does any of this matter? Well, it actually changes the way that oxygen is uh, interacts with hemoglobin and the way that it's transported in the blood and dropped off at both the lungs and the tissues. And so what are we looking at in this graph here? So often people find these types of graphs a little bit confusing. So let's just go over it very uh, slowly here. So let's just start off and look at the, the, the y-axis. So we know that y means the up and down axis. X is going to be uh, horizontal. And so represented here is a molecule without any oxygens. Here is one oxygen, two, three, and four. And what I've just said uh, is that this event is going to be slow, a little bit faster, very fast, super fast. Now, this, again, is an example of cooperativity. That's what that's called. It involves structural changes in the globin molecules as more oxygen is binding. If you did not have that, then the relationship between changes in pressure of oxygen and the percent saturation, which we have on the y-axis, would just be a straight line. Okay, but since we do have this cooperative action, slow to fast binding, you get what's called a sigmoidal or S-shaped curve. So again, on the x-axis, we're looking at the partial pressure of oxygen. And so you can see that the very top of this graph is very flat, where it's steeper down in this section of the graph right at the beginning. And as we'll see, this is going to change the way that you pick up oxygen in the lungs and the way that you drop off oxygen in the tissues. Again, this is all an example of cooperative binding. And this is not something that's unique to hemoglobin. This is something that's very common with enzymes, and it's a common feature of, of biochemistry. So I'm sure that you're going to come across this again in the future. And so this is referred to as an oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Okay, so again, it's not this linear straightened relationship, not just a diagonal from here to here, but it makes this S-shaped curve, and that's because of this cooperative binding. So there's a few impacts of this that are important. The first is that, as I said, the top of this graph where partial pressures of oxygen are high, 100 to 80 millimeters mercury, this is very flat, and so you can get a pretty decent change in partial pressures, a big drop, say, from 100 to 80, and most of your oxygen is still going to be bound to hemoglobin. So whereas at sea level, you might have a partial pressure of oxygen very close to 100 millimeters mercury, maybe up in the mountains, you have a partial pressure of 80 millimeters mercury. Despite the fact that there's this big change in the partial pressure of oxygen, and here we're talking about the, the partial pressure just in the atmosphere, you still get oxygen, which is able to bind hemoglobin at a very high rate. And again, this is because of this sigmoidal shape of this curve. If this was a straight line, as you moved down from 100 to 80 percent, or uh, uh, partial pressure, not percent, but millimeters mercury of oxygen, you'd have a much greater change in the ability of hemoglobin to interact with oxygen. And that would really compromise our ability to live at either sea level or to go vacationing in Colorado, as an example. Okay. Um, so, um, Again, so this is essential. So uh, this is essentially what I just said, but you can also look at it in uh, a, a different way as well. So what I focused on here is what's happening in the arterial blood, but the 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 situation is also the same when you moved down to forty millimeters mercury in the venous system. In this system, the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 millimeters mercury, but the hemoglobin is still able to be 75% saturated. Let's just go back for a second. So this means that you can move all the way down to here in the venous system, 
oxygen is still going to be 75% saturated. Okay, so this is referring to the amount of spots taken up on those hemoglobin molecules. And so what that means is that the venous blood, even though you have a low partial pressure of oxygen, there's still a decent amount of oxygen which remains in the venous blood. And so we call this the venous reserve, and this is oxygen that can still be used in a pinch. So most of that's what's going on at the lungs and in the blood in general, what's happening down at the tissues. So when we're focusing on the tissues, we're going to be looking down all the way at the end of the graph. So I said that this part is very flat. This part's a little bit steeper. And so what does that mean? Because it's steep, what that means is that as you go from, say, 40 to 20, now the situation is almost reversed. We're getting actually a big change in partial pressure of oxygen, or sorry, in the, the saturation of oxygen with just a relatively small change in partial pressure. So if we go down from 40 to 20 partial pressure in different tissues, for example, the saturation goes from 75 to 40. So that's going to be a big drop, much different than the uh, change of 20 millimeters mercury does at this end. So at this end, we saw that a change from 100 to 80, you're still, you're really not getting that much change in the amount of oxygen that the hemoglobin can hang on to. At this end of the graph, the situation is different. At this end of the graph, a small change on the x-axis makes a big change on the y-axis. And so why is this important? It's important because different tissues have different metabolic needs. So this end of the graph is telling us about lungs and picking up oxygen from the environment. This end of the graph is important because it's telling us about what happens at the tissue level. And this sigmoidal curve is going to impact how oxygen is dropped off at the tissue level. In normal tissues, which is represented just by somebody sitting there, not really doing too much, the partial pressure of oxygen in your tissues is 40 millimeters mercury. However, if you're being active, the partial pressure in those tissues, because you're using up more oxygen, is going to decrease. So in your active muscles, it might be 20 millimeters mercury. Now, if we compare the, the saturation in both these conditions, we see that in the inactive muscles, we have a saturation of 75%, but it's only 40% when you have uh, 20 millimeters mercury in those active tissues. You can also view this y-axis as the ability of hemoglobin to hold on to oxygen. And so as we get down to, to uh, 40, that means that at 20 millimeters mercury in the active tissues, you're less able to hold on to that oxygen. So what's going to happen in those active tissues is that hemoglobin is going to more readily give up oxygen that it is bound to. And this is going to mean that those tissues are going to get what they need. And so the more active tissue, the lower the partial pressure of oxygen in that tissue because it's using up any oxygen that it gets ultimately to make ATP. Because you're using up oxygen and you're getting a lower partial pressure, then hemoglobin is going to be less able to hang on to oxygen when it arrives. And in this case, what's going to happen is you're going to get an offloading of oxygen to those muscles. So this is all about local control, basically telling us that active tissues will get the oxygen that they need. And we've seen this before when we talked about blood flow as well. Active tissues also get the blood they need. So there are other factors which can impact oxygen association with hemoglobin, temperature, blood pH, CO2, and a concentration of a molecule called bisphosphoglycerate. Okay, you can just call it uh, BPG. Um, and so let's look at temperature. Basically, temperature is going to change this hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. 
So if this one is the normal curve, as we uh, become warmer, the curve shape is going to change. And the way that this curve shape changes, changes is it results in a decrease in affinity for O2 down in the tissues. And so what this means is that when the tissues are going to be very active, then um, when the tissues are going to be very active, then they're going to warm up and again, you can release more oxygen, okay? So just as we talked about in the last section about this resulting in more delivery of oxygen to the muscles, the same is true of heat. Active muscles are gonna be warmer. The shape of the curve here, as we move past 38 degrees towards 43 degrees, the, the curve changes shape such that you have a, a change in the affinity of, of oxygen in terms of hemoglobin binding. This is gonna result in a better release of oxygen from hemoglobin at the tissues. So the um, same thing is true of pH, carbon dioxide, and bisphosphoglycerate. And so these are all signs of active tissues. When your muscles are working overtime, then local pH is gonna increase, local carbon dioxide is gonna increase. That should make sense. If you're taking in more oxygen, then eventually you have to be putting out more CO2. And then this metabolite, B, a PG is also going to be increasing. And all of those things have the same effect. Again, they're going to be pushing the curve towards uh, this shape here. And uh, this shape is such that you're going to have an increased delivery of oxygen to situations where you have high pH, high CO2, and high bisphosphoglycerate. Okay. And so the, the, the idea here is that this is always going to allow delivery of oxygen to those tissues that need it most. So uh, this idea that when you have declining blood pH, so declining blood pH also means an increase in hydrogen ions because we know that hydrogen ions, as they increase, pH is going to lower and increasing CO2, you have this bond is gonna be weakening. So that's exactly what we've just been saying. The hemoglobin oxygen bond is gonna weaken. This effect that we just talked about in this graph here, this is referred to as the Bohr effect, okay? So the idea is that hemoglobin and oxygen bond is weakened when coming into carbon in contact with carbon dioxide or hydrogen ions this is all about metabolic activity. Active tissues are going to get the oxygen that they need most. And it's because the waste products of those cells are promoting release of oxygen from oxygen that is bound to, to hemoglobin. So that's oxygen transport in the blood. We also want to talk about carbon dioxide transport. So carbon dioxide, we think about being transported in three different forms. So like oxygen, it can also be dissolved in plasma. And it actually has a, a larger amount that is dissolved in plasma. So about 7 to 10% as just CO2. Um, and this is in contrast to the 1.5% that we talked about in terms of oxygen. Some of it can also be bound to hemoglobin. Um, and so this is about 20% of the total carbon dioxide. Um, and in contrast to oxygen, it's binding to the globin part of hemoglobin. So let's just look at our molecule of hemoglobin again. So this is going to be hemoglobin. It's got these four polypeptide genes, and each of them is binding a heme molecule. What does heme have in it? Heme has iron in it. Heme is going to interact with oxygen. Um, however, carbon dioxide, this is not interacting with that iron or that heme. It's binding to the protein part of this big complex. So the protein part are these different colored structures here. Same as oxygen, you're still binding four molecules total. So you're getting one molecule binding here, 
here, here, and here. Again, the difference being that as opposed to oxygen, which is not interacted or which is interacting with the heme molecule, carbon dioxide is bound to the protein part or the actual globin part of the molecule. Uh, so that's uh, this. So one dissolved in plasma, two chemically bound to hemoglobin, and three it's actually uh, dissolved in the blood plasma, not as CO two. So some of it's dissolved as CO two, but about seventy percent of it is is uh, dissolved as what we call a bicarbonate ion. So that's represented by this chemical formula here. The idea is that you have carbon dioxide that interacts with water. This forms car carbonic acid, and this dissociates into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. So this is the pathway that leads to uh, a bicarbonate ion formation in the blood. And again, this is how most of your carbon dioxide is carried within the blood in the form of this ion right here. So just comparing what we said for oxygen versus carbon dioxide, so for oxygen, most of that oxygen is going to be bound to hemoglobin. So 98.5% is bound to the heme component of the hemoglobin. Uh, a very small percentage here in green is going to be dissolved. With carbon dioxide, we have some dissolved as well, as, as carbon dioxide, as CO2, directly in the blood plasma. 20% is bound to hemoglobin. Okay, again, where is it binding? It's binding to the globin part of the molecule, not to the heme part. And then the rest of it is transported as a dissociated form in the bicarbonate ion. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a closer look at this yellow population. Again, this is the proportion that's dissociated within the blood as the bicarbonate ion. So all of this has to do with movement of carbon dioxide through the red blood cells. And so here we're addressing the question of why is this yellow part here so big? Why is so much CO2 converted to bicarbonate? And the idea is that you're gonna take carbon dioxide up initially into the red blood cells. And it's, in this case, some of it's gonna interact with the globin molecules, but a very large percent of it is gonna interact with water. And we saw this equation before. And then uh, the enzyme is going to convert it to uh, this molecule here, and it's going to dissociate into what we call a bicarbonate ion and a hydrogen ion. Okay, um, so you have CO2, water, they're going to combine to form this substance here, and then this is going to dissociate into a bicarbonate ion and a hydrogen ion. But we said that this bicarbonate is not being carried within the red blood cells. We specifically said in that previous graph when we were looking at the yellow section that it's carried within the blood. And this is true. And it's uh, true because this is uh, pumped out of the red blood cell into the, uh, into the blood plasma. Okay, so you have this negative molecule which is moving out into the... Um, into the blood plasma. And to counter that, you're moving a large negative charge out. The cell wants to keep things kind of the same in the red blood cell. And so at the same time, it's gonna pump in a chloride ion from the blood plasma into the red blood cell. Where does that chloride ion come from? Well, chloride, most of it is coming from NaCl or salt. So let's go through that again. So you have carbon dioxide, which is gonna move into the red blood cell, some of it, 20% is binding to the globin part of the hemoglobin molecule. It is, uh, but a significant fraction of it, most of it is going to interact with water, be converted by carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic, what's called carbonic acid. This is going to dissociate into a bicarbonate ion and a hydrogen ion. Uh, the cell doesn't want to keep that bicarbonate in the red blood cell. It puts it in the plasmid, plasma. And so to do this, it's going to pump it out using a, a, uh, a channel within the cell membrane. Uh, at the same time, it's going to counter this by bringing in a different negatively charged molecule called a chloride ion. And so this is how most of that CO2 is carried within the blood. This event here, this switching of the carbonate, bicarbonate ion 
for the chlorine, uh, chloride ion, uh, this is referred to as the chloride shift, okay? And so this is what I've just said down here as well. Remember the name of this enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, catalyzing this reaction. Now we know that enzymes, for the most part, can, can sometimes work in the other direction as well. And so um, in the other direction, when we're in the lungs, in the pulmonary capillaries, things go in the other direction. And so the bicarbonate ion is going to come back into the cell. That's going to make more negative charge. So what happens to the chloride ion? It's pumped back out. This is going to form a carbonic acid, and then carbonic anhydrase will change this to water and carbon dioxide, which can go out of your system. So if this is happening in the tissues, by the time we get to the lungs, this is, uh, this is uh, what's happening here. So again, this is going to be referred to as what? External respiration. And this is going to be referred to as internal respiration because it's happening at the tissues. Okay. Uh, next, we, we're going to look at what's called the Haldane effect. Uh, this basically describes the idea that the amount of CO2 that is uh, transported by hemoglobin is also affected by the partial pressure of oxygen. So we have the Bohr effect saying the reverse, that the amount of oxygen is affected by CO2. Well, Haldane comes along and says that the reverse is also true. So the lower the partial pressure of oxygen, um, the more CO2 can be carried in the blood. Okay? And the idea is that reduced hemoglobin, so that means hemoglobin that is not bound to oxygen, this can more easily form this, uh, this uh, carbon dioxide, which is bound to hemoglobin. So I'm not going to try to say this word. Um, and so the whole point of this is that this is going to encourage carbon dioxide exchange at both the lungs and the tissues. Okay. And so as an example, as more carbon dioxide is entering the blood, you're going to have oxy more oxygen is going to dissociate from, uh, from hemoglobin. This is, this is what we were previously referred to as the Bohr effect. But as that hemoglobin is releasing the oxygen at the tissues, it's more readily able to pick up the carbon dioxide, which has been output by those tissues as waste and is ready to be transported back to the lungs. So this is a picture of John Haldane. He's, he's also got a, a very dramatic mustache, as you can see here. So I call him the, the 1910 November winner. He's also an interesting guy in other respects. He's one of these scientists that experimented on himself, definitely not recommended. Uh, he investigated uh, poison gases, um, particularly those which, which were uh, originally used in World War I. This led to the development of the first respirator. He also introduced the idea in around the turn of the uh, uh, 20th century here um, uh, that uh, to, of using small animals in coal mines to detect harmful gases such as carbon monoxide. And so I don't know if you guys have heard of the expression before, the canary in the coal mine. This is uh, basically, this is an expression you might use to refer to something that is a, a warning system. And the idea of doing this is that uh, these guys, uh, these small animals such as, such, such as birds are having a very fast respiratory rate. And so they're gonna succumb to any toxic chemicals uh, faster than humans. And so all of a sudden, if your bird isn't doing so well, it's time to get out of the mine. Uh, one last little bit here on uh, the, the carbon dioxide in the blood uh, is that carbon dioxide and the formation of uh, the bicarbonate in the blood, this can also uh, serve to regulate blood pH. And all I really want you to, to know about this is the idea that we saw that one of the things that's moving in that system is a hydrogen ion. Hydrogen ions are representative of low pH. And so what you can do if you want to change the pH is that you can generate carbonic acid, generate carbon dioxide and water. And so this is one way that your body is able to regulate the pH of its blood. As you've learned previously, I think, the, the, uh, the pH is regulated within a very narrow range. Okay? So there's not too much change in really big swing. Part of it's because you have these systems which protects the pH of your blood.
Uh, finally here, there's a few terms which you need to know. Uh, hypoxia is inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissues. Um, and there's different types of hypoxia. So uh, you can read through them here. The one that I'll just mention briefly is carbon monoxide poisoning. This is unique because it, it, it occurs uh, so readily because carbon monoxide has such a dramatic affinity for hemoglobin. So it's about 200 times greater than the affinity of oxygen. And so just a small amount of carbon monoxide can be actually a big deal, even if you've got a lot of oxygen in the environment. Okay, okay. so to, to leave off this little bit here, we're going to watch just a short video that explains how all the stuff that we've learned so far related to respiration uh, ties together. Whether you're racing in a triathlon or doing something less strenuous, you need to breathe in oxygen to help you get energy. And breathe out carbon dioxide, a waste product. When you inhale, your diaphragm and rib muscles contract, increasing the volume of your lungs. When you exhale, these muscles relax, decreasing the volume of the lungs. When the lungs expand, air pressure in the lungs drops, causing air to flow into the lungs. When lung volume decreases, air pressure increases, causing air to flow out of the lungs. So all of this is referred to as ventilation. Air enters the nose or mouth, moves down the trachea, and goes into the two bronchi. Air moves down smaller and smaller bronchioles until it reaches a tiny sac, an alve... And air pressure in the lungs drops, causing air to flow into the lungs. When lung volume decreases, Air pressure increases, causing air to flow out of the lungs. Air enters the nose or mouth, moves down the trachea, and goes into the two bronchi. Air moves down smaller and smaller bronchioles until it reaches a tiny sac, an alveolus. Each alveolus is surrounded by capillaries. Oxygen diffuses from the alveolus to the blood, and carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood to the alveolus. As blood flows through the capillary, it becomes rich in oxygen. In the blood, Oxygen diffuses into a red blood cell and binds to hemoglobin, a protein made up of four subunits. One oxygen molecule can bind to each subunit. Oxygen-rich blood flows from the lungs to the heart. Which pumps this blood to capillaries all over the body. Here, we see oxygen diffusing from a capillary's red blood cells into a muscle cell. Oxygen is used by the cell's mitochondria to produce ATP during cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is released. How does carbon dioxide leave the body? Carbon dioxide diffuses from cells into capillaries. Some carbon dioxide stays in the plasma, the liquid part of the blood. Most carbon dioxide, however, enters red blood cells. Some carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin. The rest is converted to bicarbonate, which diffuses into the plasma. This oxygen-poor blood flows back to the heart, 
which pumps it to the lungs. There, carbon dioxide diffuses from the plasma into the alveolus. Bicarbonate enters red blood cells and is converted back to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also released from hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the red blood cells into the plasma and into the alveolus. When you exhale, air flows out of your lungs. And that's how you release carbon dioxide, get oxygen, and keep on running. Okay, so the rest of the, um, the lecture is just the uh, review questions, so take a look at those. that test both the knowledge from this lecture and also other lectures as well. Um, and so the next lecture that we give will be the, actually the final lecture of the semester, and it will be a short lecture focused on uh, control over breathing, so things like neural control, for example. So again, today we are talking about internal respiration, driven by changes in partial pressures that go in the opposite direction relative to external respiration. And we talked about some of the molecular mechanisms associated with carbon dioxide and also oxygen transport within the blood. So um, next class, as I said, control over respiration. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask.